Hey Savvy people, it's Savvy Nick here, and today I'll be installing Windows and Arch Linux side by side with the UEFI installation for Arch Linux. This will assume that you've already have or will install a copy of Windows like I have here in front of me, and that you're wanting to add on Arch Linux to dual boot with Windows. I will warn you, however, that going through this process is not easy and will require partitioning your existing hard disk which, if done incorrectly, has the potential of messing up both platforms and leaving your computer unbootable. With that being said, make sure to always keep a backup of your data before making any changes to your system, and I highly suggest doing this before continuing. At the very least, I suggest trying this on a Windows platform that you don't care about, potentially losing your data on, and that you can fiddle around with first before applying it to another computer. And with that being said, I'll go ahead and begin. So let's go ahead and search for the disk manager. If you just type in disk, you'll see something called create and format hard disk partitions. Let's go ahead and click on that. And once that opens up, we'll see a couple disks here. You can see I have a CD-ROM and a disk zero, which has a recovery partition for Windows, as well as an EFI system for booting purposes. And then of course the root C directory here, which I currently have around 120 gigs available to me. So of course, make sure that you select the proper volume on which you want to install Arch Linux on. Since I only have the one C directory here, I know that's the correct one. I'm gonna go ahead and select that. I currently have about 85% of it free or a right around 100 gigs. So what I can do is right click on the C drive and then I can shrink the volume. This will go ahead and give me space so I can install Arch Linux. So we get to enter the amount that we want to shrink the C drive by and I currently have the available size of around 103 megabytes. I'm going to go ahead and use about 60 gigs here so that's around 60000. So it says it's going to take up to 60 gigs and what the size of the C drive will be after everything's said and done. I usually go ahead and suggest around 32 gigs at a minimum for most Linux distributions, but Arch Linux can be installed on much less than that. All right, and once you specify the amount of space you wanna shrink by, we'll go ahead and hit shrink. Now you can see that we have this unallocated space. Well, for me, it's around 59 gigs, we'll say, and that's where I plan on installing Arch Linux on too. So after I'm done with this, I'm gonna go ahead and exit out and download Arch Linux. So now I'm here on the archlinux.org website where I'm gonna go ahead and hit the download button so I can get Arch Linux. All right, and once you're on the downloads page, go ahead and scroll down and find yourself a mirror to go ahead and download from. Since I'm in the US, I'm gonna go ahead and search for the for a US mirror. And Columbia works well for me, so I'm gonna go ahead and download from there. As you can tell here, we have the x86 64 bit ISO image available to us. This is what we're interested in, and the 64 signifies the type of architecture that this Arch Linux image can be installed on. So today we'll be installing it on a 64 bit computer. I'm gonna go ahead and select this and let it download. It'll take a few minutes here. And now that I've downloaded the ISO, I'm going to launch and use the Belinda Etcher app in order to flash the image onto a USB or CD. So I'm gonna search for Belinda Etcher and launch it real quick. Belinda Etcher is an easy to use application available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. I'll go ahead and put a link in the description below if you wanna download the application. You can also use any other application that can create a bootable disk, such as UNet, Bootin, or Rufus. Let's go ahead and select the image that we just got done downloading. And we'll do that by selecting an image and you can see here that we have the Arch Linux 2020-0501, so May 1st edition of the x86 64-bit image. And I'm gonna go ahead and select that and hit open. If you have a USB, CD, or DVD already in your computer, the Linatcher will automatically detect it. So make sure to go ahead and change to the proper device where you want to flash the image onto. Just make sure that the USB, CD, or DVD that you're selecting doesn't have anything on it and that everything can be erased on it because it will be once Arch Linux is flashed onto it. So I only have the one USB drive and that's the one I wanna select. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit continue. After that, I'm gonna go ahead and hit the flash button and give the Lena Etcher administrative privileges to go ahead and continue flashing. After you flash the disk, you'll take it over to the computer or server where you want to install Arch Linux on and then insert it. Then you'll have to boot into your BIOS in order to change the settings around and select the newly created bootable disk to boot first. This is usually done by finding the correct key to boot into your BIOS for your particular computer. It's usually one of the F keys like F2 or F10. Following that, you'll find a tab usually called boot order and exchange the order around so that the bootable disk is first to boot. After you have that set up, you'll save and exit out of your BIOS and you'll be able to load into Arch Linux for the install. So after this is done, I'm gonna actually hit exit here. All right, and then another way we can try booting into that bootable disk 
is directly from Windows. If we search for something called boot in the start menu, you have this change advanced startup options and it says it's related to boot menu. So let's go ahead and click on that. And here we have the advanced startup. So we can select the restart now button and then we'll get a menu here where we can hopefully select the USB CD or DVD that we just created. So I have this use a device. Let's go ahead and click on that. Okay, and once you're in here, you can go ahead and select the device where you flashed Arch Linux onto. I flash mine on this device here. If you don't see your device, you can always turn off your computer and try booting into your BIOS and changing out the boot order. So I'm gonna go ahead and select on this and give it a few seconds to load. And now in front of me, I have the option to go ahead and load into the Arch Linux live image ISO. As you can see at the top, I have the Arch Linux Arch ISO x86 64-bit UEFI CD option available to me, and that's the one I'm gonna select. If you're new and stopping by to watch and install today, please take a moment to subscribe below and hit the notification bell for more installs, tutorials, and tips about Linux and various operating systems. All right, let's select the first option and begin the install. All right, and if you've made it to the screen, you are ready to go ahead and start installing Arch Linux. Don't worry if your command line interface looks a little different than mine. I went ahead and added a font and changed the size so, so we'd be better able to go ahead and see the commands that I'm issuing. If you need a different key map than the default US standard, you can use the load keys command to go ahead and load the key map in. So you could do something like load keys. And then if you tab, you'll get a list of various different available layouts for keys. So maybe in the i386, you can search for the QWERTY layout. And inside QWERTY, there's a bunch of possibilities that you can look through. But the default here is US English, and that works great for me, so I don't have to really load keys. I'm gonna go ahead and clear this out. And then I'm gonna go ahead and verify that I have EFI supported BIOS firmware. So if we do LS, SYS, firmware, EFI, and we have this EFI VARS directory, we should get some kind of output here. If you don't get output, you more than likely have MBR enabled BIOS, and this installation doesn't really pertain to you because there's a few different installation methods you might want to go ahead and search for another install. Otherwise, if you do get an output, we're ready to go ahead and check if we have an internet connection. So I'm gonna use IP link in order to verify that I have some type of a network adapter installed. And as you can see on number two, I have ENP0S3, which is my adapter and the state says it's up. So we can test and see if we can ping archlinux.org in order to confirm our connection and I'm successfully able to go ahead and ping archlinux.org. So I'm gonna do control C to exit out of that command. And now it's time to update the system clock and check its status. So I'll do that by doing time date CTL altogether with set NTP to true. And I won't get any kind of a readout, but the next thing I'll do is check the status. So time date CTL status, and that will tell me the status of the current time. And you can see that the system clock is now synchronized. If you went ahead and made it this far, please hit the like button. It really does help me out. So now we're ready to go ahead and create the root file partition and the swap partition. So we'll do this using a tool called CF disk and then press enter. So here you can see the various different partitions that are available currently on the system. And of course, I don't wanna to touch any of these that are currently here because those are the Windows partitions currently on my machine. So those will be left alone. What I wanna do instead is go down to the free space and press enter to create a new partition. Now we're being asked for the partition size. Well, I want to leave a little bit for swap space, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'll use 56 G for gigabytes of space since I have 58.6 gigs available and save about 2.6 for my swap space. I'm gonna go ahead and press enter. And now you can see that we have a Linux file system type of 56 gigs and the device is going to be called SDA5. We'll want to make note of that because that's gonna be our root file partition and we'll need to use that later. So we wanna also create some swap space here, which is just used as a memory overflow if your physical memory gets filled up. So I'm gonna press enter again. And the partition size, well, I wanna fill it all the way up. So I'm gonna use the 2.6 gigs that's suggested, press enter. And now I wanna change the type. So we're gonna scroll over to type with our arrow key, hit type and change it from Linux file system to Linux swap. Let's press enter. And now you can see that we have two partitions created here, one for the Linux root file system and one for the Linux swap. I'm going to go ahead and write these changes now. So if I use the arrow keys and go to write, I can go ahead and allow these changes to be made. Now, again, you wanna be very careful that you didn't change anything on the Windows side of things. 
Otherwise, you can screw your Windows system up and always make sure to go ahead and back your data up before making any kind of changes to your disk. I'm gonna go ahead and write and then just type in yes to go ahead and confirm the write. After that, the partition table has been altered and as it says below, now it's done. So I'm gonna go ahead and quit out of CF disk and format the newly created root partition to ext4 and then format the swap. So to format the root partition, I'm gonna use mkfs.ext4. So we can format it as ext4. And I'm gonna call out dev sda5. And why am I using sda5? Well, as you can see up top, dev sda5 is where our Linux file system exists. And that's the one that we wanna make ext4 formatted. So I'm gonna go ahead and press enter. Now yours might have a different number, so make sure to specify whatever number, so SDA, whatever number you have your Linux file system on. That's why I said to remember it earlier. And now we're gonna go ahead and format that swap partition. So we're gonna do MK swap space dev and the swap space was created, at least on mine, on SDA6. Go ahead and put the number in according to whatever yours ended up being and press enter. So here it told us that it created 2.6 gigs of swap space and in order to turn that swap on we'll do swap on and dev and the same sda6 since since that's where our swap is located we'll go ahead and do that no errors and now that we created the file system let's go ahead and make sure to mount it so we can do that by doing mount dev sda5 which is my linux root file system and i'm going to mount that onto a folder called mount in the root directory let's also make a directory for mounting the EFI partition that's available to us so we can use that later and mount the EFI partition on there. So using CF disk, I'm just going to show something real quick. So we're looking for the EFI system and Windows already has one so we can reuse that for our Arch Linux install. So dev slash SDA2 for me is where my EFI system is currently located. So that's what I wanna make note of. I'm gonna go ahead and quit out of here. So what I'll do is make a directory first and I'm gonna make it in mount EFI and then I'm going to mount dev sda2, since that's my EFI system, on the Windows side to that new directory, the mount EFI directory. All right, and once I've done that, I can go ahead and now install the essential packages to make our system run. So we can do that by using packstrap, and we'll put that into the mount directory, since that's where we mounted our root file system. Let's go ahead and get the base package, the Linux package, and the Linux firmware package in order to get our system to run. I press enter. Now all the packages, now all the packages will be downloaded and installed. This might take a while, so go ahead and give it a few minutes here to run. And after those packages are done installing, we'll generate the fstab file using our UUID. And we can do that by doing gen fstab space dash capital U. And that's on our mount directory. And we'll put that in mount etsy fstab. And once that's generated, we're ready to go ahead and change the root directory to the newly created root file system. We can do that by doing arch dash ch root. And since we're mounted on the mnt directory, Let's go ahead and do forward slash MNT. You can see now that we're changed into our new file system. And if I do LS, you'll see some of the typical folders that you would find in a root directory. All right, now that we're in here, let's go ahead and set up our time zone first for the new system by creating a link. And we'll do that by doing LN SF. And we want to search for a time zone inside the user share zone info folder. Go ahead and tab a couple times to see all the available different zones. As you can see here, there's plenty available. Mine's in the US, so I'm gonna go ahead and use the US folder. And then look at the available territories as well. I can see that Eastern is available and that's the one I'm going with. And I wanna specify this to go to Etsy local time. Go ahead, press enter. And now let's sync the hardware clock by doing HW clock space two dashes and sys to HC. Following that, we're gonna install a text editor. 
I'm going to install Nano. So if I do Pacman, the capital S Y, Nano, that should synchronize the databases and install Nano. Do I wanna proceed? Yes, I do. Give it a few moments. All right, let's open up a file now. And that's going to be with Nano. So Nano, forward slash Etsy, locale, with an E there, dot gen. And there should be some stuff written in this file. What we wanna do here is search for the locale that pertains to us and uncomment it. So, so for me, it's the US, so I'm gonna use the control W to go ahead and search for US. For me, it's EN underscore US, so I'm gonna go ahead and search for that. And here I found the one that I wanted to use. All I have to do is uncomment this line by getting rid of the hashtag in front. And once I've done that, I can go ahead and write this file out by doing control X and saying yes to save the modified buffer and pressing enter to overwrite the file. All right, so let's do locale dash gen in order to generate our locale. Then I'm gonna press enter. And you can see that the generation was complete and it's on the locale that I selected. Now we need to go ahead and create a new file. So we'll use nano again. And it's gonna be in forward slash etsy forward slash locale dot config. So C-O-N-F and press enter. You can see it's a new file. In here, I want to put the same locale that I use for my language. So lang equal en us dot utf dash eight for me. I'm gonna go ahead and save and exit. So control X. Yes, I wanna save and yes, I wanna write the file. All right, and if you have a keyboard layout, that's not the default, which is US English, you'll need to make sure to change that to be a persistent change by editing the etsy vn console dot config file. I'll let you look up how to do that. Otherwise, we'll continue on with the default US English keyboard layout. We'll create a host name file now using nano. So nano in etsy host name. And all we wanna type in here is the host name that we wanna use for the computer. So this is what other computers will see it as on a shared network. So I'm gonna use uh, Savvy Nick for me. You can put whatever you want in here. Just make sure to go ahead and remember what you put in here. I'm gonna go ahead and save and exit out of here and write out the file. Following that, I wanna open up Nano Etsy Hosts. And in here, I just wanna write a few lines to set up my local IP settings. So 127.0.0.1. I'm gonna tab once and do localhost for that. Then colon colon one. I'm gonna tab twice there and do localhost again. And 127.0.1.1. And this is gonna be my domain. So I'm just gonna use the host name that I had before and do savvynick.local domain. I'll tab once more and just put the host name once more, Savvy Nick. You can of course change this if you have a specific IP address that you want to assign to your local domain. I'm gonna go ahead and save this and write out to the file. Now in order to go ahead and use an internet connection on this new system that we're trying to install, we're gonna go ahead and grab a few packages using Pacman. So Pacman with a capital S Y, and I'm going to install a few packages here. So netctl will be the first package. Give it a few moments here. I went ahead and chose netctl to be my network manager. You can go ahead and look up a different network manager if you're used to using something else or if you're just interested in your choices. I'm going with the default here. So I'm just gonna press enter. And yes, I do wanna install. And here is something to make note of a little bit is there's optional dependencies with netctl and some important ones that we actually want to install. So uh, Dialog and DHCP CD, as well as WPA Supplicant and the IF Plug D is, are things that want, I want to go ahead and install. So I'll do that as well, and I'll do Pacman again, SY, and I'm just gonna type those in. So Dialog space, DHCP CD, WA Supplicant, and IF Plug D. I'm gonna press enter and install those packages real quick. This will help me connect automatically to the internet and set up the network properly once I boot in to my newly installed system. After that, I wanna go ahead and add another user besides the root user with their own home directory and I'll add them to the wheel group. You can investigate what other groups are available in the system or if you just like to do this post install and add another user in with the root user, you can too, but I'll do it right now. So user add I'm gonna make them a uh, part of the group wheel, audio and video. And then I'm gonna make a new home directory called Savvy Nick. And that's what my user will be called as well. 
I'll go ahead and press enter. And now I want to define a password for Savvy Nick, so I'm going to do pass wd and type in the user Savvy Nick that we just created. Go ahead and put a password in and confirm that password. It says that the password was updated successfully. And now let me just make sure that the home Savvy Nick directory exists, and it sure does. So I'm good there. We're getting pretty close to finishing up with the install here. Just a few more steps. We can now install a bootloader. So I'll choose Grub for this one and also grab the EFI boot manager since this is an EFI install by doing pacman s and we can do Grub as well as the EFI boot MGR. Yes, we want to install that. All right, and the last thing I want to install is with pacman is pacman s and install os prober which will help us detect the Windows operating system alongside our Arch Linux install here. So this is important, don't forget to get OS Prober. I'm gonna go ahead and finish that out. And I don't see any errors. Let's go ahead and do grub-install now to install grub. My target system here is an x86 64-bit system and it's got EFI enabled BIOS, so dash dash EFI dash directory we'll have to specify that directory, is going to be located in the EFI directory which we mounted earlier. And then we want to specify that the bootloader ID is going to be grub. All right, and the installation is finished and no errors were reported, so great. One last thing is to make the config file for grub, so grub-mk-config, and then we'll do dash o for where to output it. We'll output it to boot grub into the grub config file so grub.cfg, give it a few moments. And if things go properly, what you'll see is that grub with OSB Prober detected and found a Windows boot manager on, well, my disk being SDA2, yours might be something different, but as you can see, dev SDA2, and it recognized that there's an EFI partition for Windows. So if you saw that image, you've successfully detected your Windows system. Great job. All right, and after we've finished creating the configuration file for grub. What I wanna do is set the root user password. We already created a user, but we wanna set the password for the root user. So I'm gonna go ahead and just type in pass wd, and let's put in our password and confirm it. it says that the password was updated successfully. And at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and exit and reboot so we can reboot into our newly created system. All right, and I went ahead and stopped the automatic timeout for the grub menu. And as you can see here, we have the Grub bootloader asking us which system we want to select. So we have the Arch Linux system available as well as the Windows system available to us too. So let's go ahead and just check if Windows is working properly still. I'm just going to go ahead and press enter and then log into my Windows system. All right, and I'm going to log in and I can still log in. So everything's great here. I'm just going to check the disks and in here, you can see that we have some newly created disks. So this is that swap space I created and the root file partition here. I'm gonna go ahead and exit out and just restart once more so I can get into my Arch Linux side of this dual boot system. So here's Arch Linux in front of me. I'm gonna go ahead and let it automatically time out and it automatically boots into Arch Linux. And as you can see, I'm here welcomed by a login here. So I'm gonna try that new user I created, Savvy Nick, and then I'm gonna go ahead and put my password in and I'm logged in as Savvy Nick. Great, congratulations if you made it this far. You've successfully dual booted Arch Linux with Windows. Let's go ahead and try logging in as the root user as well. Sue root, and then type in the password for root. And you can see that I'm now the root user. The one last thing I wanna look at is if I actually have a connection to the internet. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do ping Google here and it says temporary failure in name resolution. That's because I went ahead and installed that NetCTL for my network manager, but really haven't configured anything quite yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that next. First thing I wanna do is change directories while I'm using root to etsy netctl. And in this directory, I'm gonna ls some of the files out and I have a few folders available. So I wanna copy something from the examples folder into this directory. So I'll do that by doing cp examples forward slash. Let me list out what we have available. I want the Ethernet DHCP for my instance. You might want one of the wireless configurations if you have a wireless connection. Mine's an Ethernet wired connection. So I'm gonna use the Ethernet DHCP 
and I want to go ahead and copy that over to the netctl folder, so here, and you can name it whatever you want here for a custom profile, so I'm just gonna name it custom DHCP profile for myself and press enter. Now I should have that file, and I sure do. So I'm gonna open it up with nano, and in here I see that the interface is currently set to ETH0. Well, I don't think that's what mine's called, so I'm gonna go ahead and take a look. I'm just gonna go ahead and exit out, control X, and following that, clear the screen and type IP space link. And this gives me the network adapter name, which is ENP0S3. Yours might be something different, but I wanna make note of that and use that inside this custom profile. So I'm gonna open up the custom profile back up and I'm gonna change the interface to be ENP0S3. And the other thing I wanna do is set my DHCP client to what I installed, which was DHCP CD for me. And of course, if you downloaded a different network manager, you don't wanna really follow along, you're done installing everything. But I got a few more things to set up here. So after that, I'm gonna save and exit out of this file. And now I wanna enable the profile by doing netctl enable and that custom DHC profile that I created. You can see now that it's been enabled. And finally, I wanna go ahead and enable the DHCP service as well. And I can do that by doing system CTL enable DHCP CD dot service and press enter. At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and try pinging Google again and I get a failure, but I wanna go ahead and reboot real quick just to test and make sure that my services start running. All right, I'm gonna log back in and see if I can ping Google this time. And I sure can. As you can tell, I'm successfully pinging out to Google at this point. My services have started and everything seems to be running great. That means that the DHCP client was able to grab an IP address from the router and everything seems to be running. It'll be a very similar process if you wanna get a Wi-Fi interface set up. You'll just have to use one of the Wi-Fi profile examples and type in your username and password as well as what adapter your Wi-Fi is using. Well, I hope you enjoyed this installation tutorial on how to dual boot with Windows 10 and Arch Linux. I know this one took a while, but it's very rewarding whenever you get Arch Linux finally installed and working, and now you're free to go ahead and customize it however you want. So the next few things you would probably do is go grab a desktop environment and install some packages that you like using so you can have a graphical user interface, or just keep it minimal the way it is right now. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions in the comments section below. Also, make sure to subscribe for future videos and make sure to like the video. Thanks for watching.